Hello, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to this session from IAP, the Inter-Academy Partnership. Um, we'd like to thank the, the World Academy of Art and Science for this opportunity to present um, some of our work and, and have this discussion about um, the topic of this conference, global leadership in, in the 21st century. Um, I don't want to spend too much, but just to say two words about the Inter-Academy Partnership. It's a global network of academies of science, medicine and engineering. We have around 140 members. Our first speaker will give a, a lot more detail about IAP and what we do. Um, but the essence of it is to try and distill um, current science, the best scientific knowledge into policy advice um, through studies and reports to inform policymakers, whether at national, regional or global levels. Um, so we have six speakers with us today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so that I can quickly introduce them to you. Um, okay, I hope you can now see it. Will somebody give me a thumbs up if they can see my screen. Um, so the, the first one is Volker Termoylen. He's the president of IAP. He's based in Germany. Um, he's the former president of the German National Science Academy, the Leopoldina, and also a, a virologist and pediatrician by training. Um, following him, each speaker will have about 10 minutes each. We will have Cheryl Hendricks, um, Director of the Food and Nutrition and Wellbeing um, Institute in the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, and she'll talk about a particular IAP project on food and nutrition security and agriculture from the regional and global perspective. And then we will have Robin Fears, is the European Academy Science Advisory Council, ESAC. This is a network of European academies affiliated to IAP, and he's responsible for the biosciences program there. And again, he'll be talking about uh, an ESAC initiative as well as a global IAP initiative. Following Robin, we'll have Jackie Cado, the executive director of the Network of African Science Academies, NASAC. It's headquartered in Kenya, in Nairobi. Um, and like ESAC for Europe, NASAC is our IAP regional network for Africa. Um, then we have Teresa Stepler. She's a member of the Global Young Academy. Um, the GYA is one of the newest members of the Inter-Academy Partnership, elected um, just last year. Um, and Teresa is also a colleague of ours in the, the Secretariat of IAP, looking after the IAP policy um, group. Um, and then the, to sort of finish off the group of speakers that we have, we have Atia Mosam, also from South Africa, um, she is at the South African Medical Research Council Center for Health Economics and Decision Science and is also a participant, one of our alumni of an IAP project that provides um, leadership training and networking opportunities, what we call our Young Physician Leaders Program. Um, so without further ado, I will load up the slides of... Um, Volker to Moylen and allow Volker to take the stage. Um, okay, Peter. Okay, thank Thanks you, Volker. The floor is yours, your slides will appear. Okay, more. thank you very much. I welcome also those who are listening and watching us, and those who are watching can see whether our picture Peter has shown is still matching the reality or whether we need an update on this. But anyway, we are happy that you are with us. And for me, it is a little bit, you know, a new you know, experience that I talk to a group of people and don't see them. This usually is not, not my, my, my experience. But anyway, modern times also needs modern technology. But I would like to start to just introduce to you about what is an academy. And since I, I think that maybe some of you are not so familiar, 
And um, as you see here in this uh, PowerPoint, there are four bullet points. And these bullet points really show that what is an academy? An academy is an institution. And in this institution, it, this elects on merit basis scientists, scientists from the area of, of natural sciences, of medicine, of humanities, and of engineering. And this group in an academy is, is form, has a certain activity. On the one hand side, they discuss science. They are actually mainly interested in interdisciplinary discussion, workshops, meetings, etc. But over the last years, more and more in the, in the center of activity comes the advice to policymakers. And those of you who have been familiar with COVID-19 and have followed up what's going on in your own country, you may have seen this, the academies of your country has given advice to the society and given advice to policy on the issue of COVID-19. And uh, I can only say from my own experience in Germany, this was quite helpful at least not only to politicians, but also to the society because the society can then get informed about what is all about such a pandemic. This advice we are giving is independent. It is uh, free of vested political and commercial interest. And uh, it is certainly a basis in which uh, good information is coming together because the best scientists in the country are actually forming the academy which uh, is in the center of, of the present activity. May I have the next one, Peter? So, so uh, what is uh, IAP? Yeah, Peter already mentioned uh, IAP. IAP has now is some sort of an umbrella organization which brings together all these 140 uh, national science academies in medicine and engineering. And uh, they are distributed over the globe and you see we have there on the left hand side the, the group of the Inter American National Academy of Sciences from North and South America. In the center, we have ESA, European Academy of Science Advisory Council, which brings together the European National Science Academies of the EU member states. Then on the bottom, you see Africa, NASAC. Although Africa has 52, if I'm not mistaken, 52 nations. There we have right now 28 science academies and we have a, quite a group of young academies. So Africa is growing and building up new academies. And we have this big continent, Asia, in which we also have about 38 science academies which form a network. These regional networks, I would consider the backbone of IAP because they not only give advice to policymakers and to society in their own region, but they also cooperate together. And we will hear examples today how this cooperation globally actually, actually can, can function. So this is the, 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 the board of our activities, as you can see here. Next one, please. So, Peter, the next slide, please. So what are our objectives and strategic priorities? So uh, what we are doing right now is really to to, um, to, to have, to build up, I would like to have the other one, the strategic priorities, Peter. Uh, go back, please. Um, this is something where, where you can see what, what we are doing. We are building up capacity and, and uh, the, in, the, in the different regional academies. We have to, to, to build up new academies if possible give financial support for them. We also um, <clears throat> see that uh, activities are developed in research, education, and literacy. And of course, it, it is something what is of, of our agenda to strengthen the cooperation between all these academies on the global network. So in the next um, PowerPoint, you will see some examples of it, of our activity. For example, there is one, one is this preparing a statement. What is a statement? A statement is a short document of about four to five pages. And these statements have, are prepared by the academy. They are endorsed by the academy and they have certain topics. And I have chosen here two topics just to illustrate what it means, for example, 
there is the call of uh, action to tackle the growing burden of dementia. This comes from the medical field, of course, we all know that dementia is a very important development in medicine, in particular in the older age group of our societies. And there are certain you know, now uh, initiatives have to be taken and have to be developed, which are dealt with in this document. Or the other one, which you can see here, is, is a, a call to declare trauma as a disease. Why is this important? Medicine one should not separate trauma from disease because trauma is leading quite often to disease. And this is an important aspect, in particular, if it comes you know, to health insurance, to, to rehabilitation, etc. So this is something which really has to be, be, be uh, acknowledged and have to be developed. Another example is reports. And uh, if we see in the next uh, um, PowerPoint, you will see that uh, reports are also a major document which are prepared by the uh, <coughs> uh, IAP. And I give you an example, and an example is, for example, the topic of food and nutrition security and agriculture. This is a global pro a topic of great importance. And uh, we have started this a few years ago, but because we thought, you know, with the, with the climate change developing, with the uh, uh, increase in population, this is a question where science could play a role. So this, this entire report is dealing with the question, what can science contribute to the questions of um, food and nutrition security. And we will hear after my presentation to Professor Sharon Hendricks more details about this initiative, about these activities where the individual regional networks had produced a report and out of these reports then, which were individually presented, where then a global view be taken and the analysis were done, what is common and what is not common. And, on, and in this way, you know, we have to work from a different aspect. And the similar things is going on with climate change and health. This is shown on the next slide, where you can see that uh, uh, climate change is a topic which is right now, of course, still high on the agenda. But health is an aspect which only recently has developed into an, 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 uh, a point that people will pay attention to it. And one has to see this also under the present situation that we see with COVID-19. So this is a, such an interesting topic in which we also follow the same rule that, that uh, this will be dealt with by the, uh, by the different region networks of the different continents. We are still in process, a little bit delayed through COVID-19, but certainly it, it will turn out to be a very important report and giving advice and to to, to uh, the regional activities like the European Union, for example, or the African Union, but also to the United Nations or to the S20 and the G7 academies meetings together with the uh, <coughs> state, states representatives. So this was report. Then we come to the next example which is a strategic priority that promotes the importance of science and research, education, and literature. Of course, we feel the responsibility that in our activities, we also have to deal with these questions. These questions, for example, women in science. This is something quite important. And uh, it is uh, where we have to help, where we have to give advice, and in particular, uh, that we can have the possibility in the IAP to compare different activity in different regions and different continents. And you see here three reports with um, the, that promote the importance of women in science, research, and education there. And you see here in that these reports have been started originally in the Americas, the Americas did an analysis and an evaluation in the, the, the different academies and the different countries and uh, portrayed also, also in, in very outstanding women as a, as a model for, for showing what can be achieved. Then it was picked up uh, in, in Africa and NADA also carried this out and also did a very interesting study, very inspiring what they have seen and also what they are demanding, what has to change. And then, and then finally, the Asian network also, ASA also picked it up 
So yeah, we have three big continents in which this issue is high up on the, on the, on the priority list, in which is of importance, and has, I think, provided very interesting information worthwhile for all of you who are looking to look it up. So next priority is um, the importance in science research education, the, uh, which the next the PowerPoint is showing to you. And that has something to do, for example, with the dual use research in life sciences. This is, of course, a question when you look up in the discussion we have in COVID-19, there are still voices they think this virus has been escaped from a laboratory. Is this something which has been manipulated in the lab? Is this dual use of research is always something which is quite important. And whenever a research application is, is for example, being applied for my own country, I can tell you there is a committee, and the committee always checks whether there is a dual use is coming out of the experiment or not, and whether there are certain precautions who ha has to be has to be taken place. And this is really something I would say one has to watch, and we feel a responsibility in IAP, you know, to give guidance to these questions. And those for, of you who have worked in this area now, when you think when you think about the influenza situation a couple years ago, gain of function experiments where we had, where we had a moratorium in the US on this issue of, of dual use research. So the next one is also an example of our activity. And this is the young physician leaders. What does it mean? This is a group of young physicians which get a particular training program and we will hear here today something on this issue from our colleague from South Africa. She belongs to this group and this group I think is has, 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 has very interesting to observe how these young physician leaders you know, are trained and get experience outside their own medical field so that the physician later on is not only concentrating on his expertise he has in medicine, but also realizes there are other obligations one has in medicine which one has to fulfill if one takes up a, a, a role as a leader in this area. Next one. And now I think I'm almost coming to the end, but I would like to say something about COVID-19. You and those of you I think who, who have experienced all this may have seen how difficult it is to convince maybe politics on the one hand side and also society. And uh, IAP has taken up this issue. We are in our academies too. And uh, we have just uh, published um, a communique in March because we have realized that in the COVID-19 discussion, all the countries affected by the virus were looking on their own problem and have forgotten that this is, this is a pandemic. Pandemic means it is distributed all over the world and that one actually needs global leadership in this, in this uh, approach, which is taken, of course, at the one hand side by WHO, but there are also, in the, if you look back into former epidemics like if, uh, Ebola or we have the SARS epidemic, you know, there were countries, you know, like the United States, who took it up as an important issue to lead and to help and to coordinate activities. And this is something which is really needed, still needed up to date to overcome, to overcome IAP. And I can tell you from my own experience, yesterday we had in ESAP, the European Academy Science Advisory Court, a very interesting discussion about our member academies. Each of the member was giving their experiences they had on, on, in their own country. What did the academy do? What did the, how did the, the, the politic reacted? And from this, I think we are preparing some sort of a small, small summary. And the same is taking place in the different region. And now that the North and South American group, the INAS has, has also had a, a, a meeting, a video conference, of course, and they are also preparing something. So we are collecting the information all over the globe, what the academies have experienced, how COVID-19 was actually managed or not managed, and what lessons we can learn. And I think with this, I actually almost can, can close. May I have the next one, the last one? It shows, you know, the call for global solidarity, the, the academy response here to COVID-19. I mentioned this, that we are collecting this, trying to put it together and use it then for further discussion and further report here right now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Volker. Um, I will stop sharing and I think pass on directly to 
Um, Cheryl, would you like to share your screen? Um, you thank you, Volker. We're going to pass to Cheryl. Okay, yeah. over to you. Sorry, struggling with the unmute button. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to present on this exciting project. Um, it was an innovative experiment on the on behalf of IAP. Um, so the Food um, and Nutrition Security and Agriculture Project was a unique project that led to a set of, of reports with quite a number of uniquenesses. So th these reports, as Volker mentioned, relate to strategic priority number two, to empower academies and region regional academics to contribute to these independent, evidence-based, authoritative reports on very specific um, topical issues. The issue of food security and nutrition was specifically chosen because it deals with transboundary and multidisciplinary um, research that requires the input of a range of different experts in order to understand the complexities of the, of the topic and also to deal with the regional variations in the, the production and the consumption of food as well as regional political um, environments that influence the food systems um, of those various situations and also influence the policies that are chosen. So the topic um, was very relevant when we set out for this in 2015, but it's probably more relevant to today. And I think that this provides one example of how concrete evidence can provide global leadership um, in anticipating problems and setting the stage for what governments can do. So the advice that's contained in these reports is very relevant for the current COVID context. So the project was initiated um, in 2015 and it, it poses a very unique example. So I'm going to take you through the model, the approach, and the different components of this project to show how it was unique and how it can provide a model for for other opportunities. So while many consensus reports um, exist on topics, including food security and nutrition, this one was quite unique um, in that it dealt with the work in a very comprehensive way and dealing with a complex um, issue that requires various different perspectives. So there couldn't be a better way of doing that by using and harnessing the broad range of expertise across the academies in order to address this topic. It's not the first report on food security and nutrition, and there's a vast body of literature that already exists, but there isn't very clear consensus on some of the policy issues, and this is really what this project set out to do. How do you identify the, the clear gaps um, from different disciplinary perspectives, different national perspectives and regional perspectives, as well as then how do you synthesize this into a readable account of what options are available for science and technology, as well as then for the policy makers. And so IAP, under the leadership of Volker and Jochen van Braun, saw an opportunity to harness the capacity um, of, the, of the expertise across the world to do this and to, to communicate clearly on what is quite clearly a politically loaded topic. Um, but where is the evidence and the science for doing this? So the project set out with three guiding principles, and these align then with the IAP's um, mandate. Firstly, how do we safeguard international public goods with food security being a public good that needs to be attained at a scale that's not really attainable by individual countries. There are many cross-boundary and transboundary issues that need to be dealt with. Secondly, the need to clarify and address the international environment and the institutional risks um, and, and the opportunities for their transition. So in all food security policy, there are significant trade-offs between economic, social, and environmental concerns. And how do we go about addressing these in an informed way is what the team set out to do. It also is very topical because it relates to the achievement of the SDGs. So although food, food and nutrition security relates to SDG 2 directly, 
there are elements of these components in every one of the SDGs. So this also contributed to the IAP's um, drive to help realize the SDGs. So what was unique about the model? The model really rested in the ownership from, from the um, academies, from a national level through to the regional, and then to produce a global synthesis report. These reports were signed off by the academies, um, having to look at the contentious issues and the controversies and put their stamp of approval on the final product. The project involved over, um, part over 320 participants that were nominated from over 130 national um, academies. So this shows the broad scope of it. So there were two global meetings that were held to review the progress and to present the initial findings and then to discuss the content of the global report. These meetings were extremely animated, engaging and collegial although many times the, the participants had to really thresh through the controversies and come to an agreement about what would be presented as unclear um, controversies and where we could find um, common ground. So four regional groups started out with a 10 point template that set out um, not in a, in a, a very, um, in a broad way, so the interpretation was left to the various um, regional um, academies as to how to interpret these 10 points, but to make sure that the situation about food security was presented from a very multidisciplinary perspective. So from public health, nutrition, environmental studies, the competition for natural resources, as well as then how do we preserve biodiversity. So each region identified the major scientific challenges and the opportunities, what the knowledge gaps were, and what the impact of national regional regulatory frameworks um, were on food security um, issues. So the four independent um, reports were peer reviewed, and these provided a very rich platform for engagement throughout the project. So in the preparation of the report, stakeholders um, and policymakers were engaged. And I'll show you a little later about the broad um, engagement um, post the production of these reports. So these four reports provided the material for the fifth global synthesis report, which was also um, peer reviewed and brings together the major focus of each of these um, four regional reports. One of the other co um, innovative components of this particular project was the comprehensive global engagement strategy that um, was launched at the beginning of the project and sought to help publicize and bring to the attention of policymakers and civil society um, the content of these reports. So this included a press kit, press conferences, social media sharing, and media coverage. So over 130 um, articles have appeared in press um, in over 20 languages. Four journal articles have been published on the process and the model of this particular approach. The reports have been presented at various important conferences, including World Academy meetings, regional meetings, the S20 preparation meeting in Rosario, um, Argentina, and then to specific um, disciplinary um, programs such as the World Health Summit and United Nations meetings. So there's been very broad engagement um, of, across the various sectors with, with these reports at the regional level as well as at the global level. So the report um, provides us with a, a neat example of the power of the IAP process um, in able to, being able to harness the potential of science and find su sustainable solutions for complex systems such as dealing with, with food systems, food security and nutrition. It showed the collective academy work that provided a, con a strong consensus around controversial issues the recognition and appreciation of diversity. So particularly in the global report, you'll see a beautiful capture of the diversity across regions and how these um, are important for the particular policy context. 
the evidence-based messages um, are also very important for the for identifying opportunities and lobbying the, for the investment in science in particular. And the learning across the regions was um, very important, as well as helping um, the participants to understand how important it is to uh, communicate the results of these reports. And so a range of people were involved um, in communicating that and in preparing um, the reports. So this is very timely advice um, on the topic, but it also does something bigger in that it equips over 320 um, academics with dealing with the issue and being able to talk around the issue with people from different disciplines. And at the a time like we face now, that is one of the crucial empowering components of this project is having a broad base of people across the world who are able to engage on a critical topic, not only from their own disciplinary perspective, but being able to see the perspectives of others and to think more broadly around the trade-offs and the consequences of particular stances um, on this um, topic. So unfortunately, there's not enough time for me to go into the content of the reports. Um, each one is rich in its own way and um, should really be engaged with as part of a COVID um, policy assessment um, process. So if you want to um, find the reports, you'll find them on the link at the end of these slides. They really do make for, for wonderful reading and I can contest to being very much empowered and enriched by the engagements of our fellow contributors to this project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, I begin to understand that what we miss on this um, Zoom conference is, is the round of applause for every speaker when they finished. But <laughs> um, I hope you can uh, appreciate that from the, the, the silence of the, the, the viewers here. Um, Robin, shall we pass on to you? You're going to talk about climate change and health and also um, COVID and building back better, if I recall correctly. Okay. Didn't do it. Okay, just hold on while I try and do that again. Okay, so, sorry for delay. Uh, I, I also have to confess um, that I may not look much like the picture that Peter showed earlier. Uh, barber shops in, in England have been closed for three months now, and uh, some of us are looking the worst to wear consequence. Um, apart from that, I, I, I thank IAP and the organisers of this conference for, for inviting me to this uh, very innovative format and, and discuss some very important issues. Um, I will um, spend most of my time uh, talking about a project that uh, Volker previewed, uh, Climate Change and Health, um, that actually uses a very similar model to, to the one described by Cheryl just now, um, so I can build on, on what they have already told you. Um, okay, climate change and health, as Volker said, we, we've heard about climate change for, for a number of years, but at a political level, health has not been a, a major focus. Um, the relationships are complex, mediated by a number of climate impacts, uh, flooding, heat, um, impacts on agriculture and so on, but that, that in turn have, have a number of consequences for air pollution, environmental degradation, water quality, and so on. And those in turn have consequences for, for example, infectious disease, respiratory disease, uh, direct heat related illness, uh, malnutrition, and many others. Um, this slide taken from the US CDC, uh, gives up an overall perspective of the complexity of the impacts of climate change and health, human health. I, I won't go into a, a lot of detail on all of these points, um, but we'll refer you to our publications. Um, despite what, what this slide appears to show in terms of an enormous level of detail, 
that there is much still to be learnt about the current impacts of climate change on health, projected future impacts, variation across the world, uh, and, and particular problems for vulnerable populations, the elderly, the young, the marginalised, and, and so on. So, so there is a lot still to be done in, in collecting knowledge and a lot still to be done in turning knowledge into solutions. Um, as Cheryl um, described very clearly, um, the interregional project de design of IAP uh, it is singular uh, in a number of its attributes and actually adds value to work that's been done by others, even in an area where, where there's already been a lot of work. Um, I, I'll just pick out a couple of points in this slide to, to reinforce um, what Cheryl said for another project. Um, we look across multiple disciplines and across geographical boundaries, of course. Um, we're, we're independent of vested interest or academies are independent. Um, there's a common starting point, um, and I'll come back to that, but essentially that's essential it, if there are parallel regional groups. Uh, we need a common starting point, otherwise, of course, they will end up in very different endpoints. Uh, as Cheryl said, we show where there's consensus, but it also shows where there isn't consensus and how we might tackle that. Um, what one point that very relevant to the other contributors to, to this session and to the conference overall is that our objective, our external objective to deliver science advice uh, is complemented by an internal IAP objective to build capacity within our academies. Um, so that as Cheryl says, we can create a, a, a nucleus of experts around the world to engage on this topic. And that includes, uh, very much involves younger researchers. I'll, I'll also give you an example of how we translate what we find in the way of solutions into impact. Uh, and, and as I hope it will be obvious from what Cheryl said and, and what I'm saying, this model of project design actually is applicable uh, for other topics and, and for other bodies. Um, okay. Uh, Volker's already shown this slide. I'll just have it here to, to make one point. The project on, on climate change and health differed from the IA project on food and nutrition security and agriculture in one respect. Um, so for climate change and health, we, we currently have three regional working groups in Africa, Asia and the Americas. The European working group started rather earlier and has already reported um, that that ESAC European work has helped to catalyze and nucleate a discussion in the other regions and obviously also has helped to uh, provide starting points for the global work. As I just mentioned, um, the, the project is designed very innovatively to try and catalyse diverse activity, building on a diverse range of evidence and perspectives around the world. Um, but of course that diversity has to be turned into something that's coordinated in the final event. Um, and the way that we have taken this forward in IAP to try and achieve that clarity and coherence is to have a common agreed starting point for the different regional activities. And, and this is some of the um, starting points for climate change and health. They may seem very obvious, what are the effects now? Uh, what are the likely future effects? What can we do about them? Uh, where is there knowledge gaps that need to be filled? What are the particular issues for vulnerable groups and, and so on. Um, but there, there's several cross-cutting themes in, in all of this. Uh, we want to be distinctive in what we do, not merely to uh, duplicate the work or duplicate um, the outputs from other groups. Um, so we're very much aware of how we can uh, add value to what's already been done by others and, and how we can complement that. And indeed, capitalizing on the design of the project, how we can link the work and our recommendations at the local, regional and global levels. And again, this is a theme of the, this e-conference overall to, to generate leadership across all the levels and to ensure coherence in doing that. Okay, let's, uh, this is the USAC report. It's just about a year old. Uh, I'll say, very little about the content because it's available in the report online on the USAC website and, and the IAP website. Um, the point I want to make about the report is that 
although of course our, our recommendations are specific to Europe, uh, to climate impacts and to health effects, um, the, the themes of, of the recommendations are, are generalizable um, more broadly for finding solutions in, in other um, uh, critical areas. Um, so our recommendations focus on the, the need to link research and policy development, um, the need to communicate um, the problems in this area to the public at large, as well as to policymakers, and Volker already mentioned that. Um, the emphasis on, on using evidence already available. A lot of evidence is available and isn't used and, and isn't implemented. Uh, and in the case of health, health is often seen as a sector different from all the other sectors. So for example, policy decisions in agriculture or the urban environment or um, transport do not take into account impacts on, on health. Um, so that very much the mantra from, from WHO, health in all policies is, is critically important uh, in climate change. But in addition to using evidence that's already there, there are of course gaps in, in our knowledge uh, and it's very much a, a role and a responsibility of the academies and others in, in the science space um, to advise on how to fill those knowledge gaps. Um, Okay, so without going into a lot of detail on the solutions, I just want to finish uh, with a couple of other points. Um, again, like Cheryl, um, we put a lot of effort into um, engaging with um, others on the basis of our outputs. Um, this is a European example because, of course, IAP as a whole hasn't yet got outputs in, in climate change and health. But, but in the year... Uh, since the Europeans published their report in this area. But we have been very active in engaging uh, in, in various ways to try and ensure that the solutions we're recommending do have impact uh, with policymakers or, or other stakeholders. Um, how do we do that? Well, in, in this case, of course, um, most obviously our European work has fed into regional discussions and, and the IAP global uh, project overall. Secondly, um, we've been active in, in engaging with policymakers in, in Europe um, to talk about these issues, to, to um, advise how our um, evidence and our recommendations can be uh, translated into action uh, in, in Europe, but, but also globally, so, so that we've engaged with um, a number of UN organizations, WHO, FAO, Economic Commission, uh, uh, Dessa and others. We have also um, been act very active engaging more broadly with the wider scientific community in, in the ways that Cheryl mentioned previously uh, and with the public but via media. Uh, at the European level, uh, published our report a year ago, we've continued to extend the analysis, for example, to the Arctic region and I refer you to our website for details of that. So, very active focus on engagement and impact. I, I will just finish with, with another example of impact on a separate but very much related area. And this is the green recovery after COVID. Um, as a, a number of our societies are beginning to recover from the peak of a pandemic, obviously thoughts begin to turn to how to boost the economic uh, situation that has been in suspension for the last few months. Um, where we begin to make a, a number of points um, about what is needed to be considered by policymakers in this area of the green recovery. This, this is work in progress. Uh, IAP will be publishing a communique on, on this topic uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, broadly, National academies are also working in this area, and regional academy networks, and of course they're well advised, well placed to advise on, on country actions and regional actions and IAP to uh, connect the local, regional and global again. Uh, but some of the key messages which are being developed is that um, decarbonisation, that is a low carbon economy, doesn't mean to say uh, that you cannot have economic benefits, it is compatible with economic benefits. Uh, but the objective must be multiple wins, that is not just economic benefits, but also benefits for human health, planetary health, and for equity. Uh, 
the, the other common message for, for much of our work is that, of course, the solutions based on science are already within reach. Um, that there is evidence that we can use to uh, refine and promote policy, but of course, science is also central um, in identifying new uh, research to fill the gaps. And, and also, science is central to the public acceptance of new policies. COVID-19 has taught many of us, particularly in Europe, uh, that our policymakers are, are very closely aligned uh, on COVID-19 with, with the need to uh, take account of scientific advice. It, it's, it's something that we haven't necessarily seen before in, in many of our countries. We're seeing it now, um, science-based policies, but, but also what we're seeing that the public acceptance of those new policies also depends on, on the public trust and acceptance of the science. Uh, and that, of course, again, is a very important point in, in terms of uh, leadership and uh, uh, providing advice. So I'll, I'll finish there. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, you get your silent round of applause as well. So thank you. Um, <laughs> I'll take it as red, yeah. Yes. Um, moving on very swiftly, Jackie, are you ready to show your screen and go ahead? Yeah. Uh, Jackie from NASAC, the Network of African Science Academies. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, maybe I'll go back here. So I'm going to talk about science advice in the African content. And um, I think I'm really really glad to be able to speak after Robin and Cheryl uh, and Volker as well, because it puts into context what uh, the network of African Science Academies uh, is trying to do, but secondly, the place of the network within the discussion of global social challenges. So I'll talk about five things, and, and I'm very aware that I have uh, very little time. Um, try and discuss a little bit about our role as a network, what it means to be a network of science academies, what uh, it takes to be uh, a partner of policy making, our experience, I'll highlight, highlight a bit of that, and then crucially tackle on uh, the aspects that both Teresa and Atia will touch on in how we can engage young scientists in the process of doing what we do. And then I'll conclude by just saying what really at the end of it when it's all said and done would make science advice not just useful but valuable for the people that it's targeting. So I'll start off by uh, explaining the role of the networks. Uh, all our networks and essentially I'm talking about the ESAC, INAS, um, ASA uh, together with NASAC that forms their affiliate regional networks for uh, IAP, we are mandated one to try and encourage scientists to set up new academies in countries where none exist, but then also to strengthen the capacity and the role and the mandate that existing science academies can bring uh, to, to play in terms of injecting science in everyday issues, in policy making, in dealing with society. But specifically looking at science advice, which is what uh, my key topic of today is, is the networks provide two avenues that science advice can flourish. One, the fact that, uh, and I think you saw that from Volker's explanation of what an academy is, but just to provide that independent platform, that credible advice can be sought. And this independence is critical because if you uh, give out biased advice, then the practicality of using it becomes very limited. So the network guarantees that that independent platform actually is offered. But then last and not least, which is one of the mandate of the network, is to be the voice of science in the region. So for our network, we as a, a NASAC uh, pride ourselves in saying that we get scientists together, uh, academies together to be able to speak on behalf of science and to speak for science. So we are proud to say that we are able to uh, uh, be the voice of science in the continent. Now, Something, and I think you've noticed in the presentation of both Robin and Cheryl, is that policymaking is really, really no walk in the park. I mean, the policymakers have to deal with issues that impact on life here and now, 
but also that they are always pressured to produce results uh, in the shortest time possible. And this is critical because you notice that policymaking has cycles. So science has had to find a way of dealing with that and find a mechanism that the partnership between policymaking and science can, uh, can prosper. Uh, we do that from a network perspective, especially when we are tackling uh, global social challenges in four ways. First is to ensure that the uh, science advice is given is actually of scientific merit. And to guarantee that we have to put in place a process that would ensure that the peer review mechanism is adhered to. Uh, the peer review mechanism ensures that science is not just sound, but also world, world class and can be verified. Uh, the second aspect of ensuring that the partnership between policy and, and science works is to ensure that whatever science is, is being uh, uh, championed actually can be moved from the lab into the field. We're talking about moving theory into practice. So that translation is what academies stand for and to try and develop outputs that will en enable us to uh, translate theory into practice. Thirdly, the fact that academies go beyond specific expertise of scientists, specific uh, uh, disciplines, uh, they go beyond different stakeholders because you've seen in how the interactions happen, the varied stakeholders have to be able to see the usefulness of science. The convening power of academies and of science networks are critical because it is on bringing the players onto the table that the topics under discussion can actually be relevant. So academies and the networks play that role of being able to convene different stakeholders in any one uh, uh, topic, in any one theme, to be able to come up with solution that would apply across the board. But then last and not least is to always guarantee that the scientific breakthroughs are, are visible. Uh, we suffer a lot from the African continent because most of the a local um, scientific breakthroughs are not highlighted as much as we would like to. And simply, uh, this might at times go unnoticed. And for that very reason, academies exist because then we can emphasize what science works and what science doesn't and showcase the excellence that we have. In specific terms, and I think just uh, leading uh, from uh, what Cheryl and, and uh, Robin have highlighted as specific reports that we've done, or specific reports we've done on food, nutrition, uh, security, and agriculture, and then the climate change and health one that we're currently doing, is to try and unpack those reports into a language that non-scientists can understand. What we've done as a network is to try and produce those in form of policymakers booklets. The policymakers booklet try to present the science on key global social challenges in a way that is not only uh, presentable, you can see the artistic nature of the presentation, the fact that the science is really, really, the scientific jargon is downplayed to a point that we use basic language to be able to communicate what the recommendations are. But then also something that Sharon, uh, Cheryl mentioned is that we need to build consensus around those recommendations. So to find a mechanism to be able to do that within the panels that we constitute is an art that I think the academies and the networks have now mastered. So our policymakers booklets ensure that the partnership between science and policy actually thrives because then the policymakers are able to understand and see the science as being relevant. Uh, what then do we do to be able to say that we have a track record? I think I saw one of Robin's slides uh, mentioning the fact that the, inclus the inclusive nature of our work is what gives us the ownership especially when you're producing a report that has to impact not just societal change, but also has to be reflected in the policymaking framework. Now, we've noticed and have realized that science would not be practicable or would not be valuable to policymaking if they're only involved at the end. So at the beginning of the process of either documenting uh, the recommendations or coming up with a report, we try and find avenues to engage our decision makers. Now, 
we use the term decision makers because sometimes our report will take almost a year or so to be able to uh, conclude. But because we don't want to be uh, pressured or influenced by the nature with which political systems work, we target decisions maker because decision makers because they would live longer than the political cycles that we've seen. And that means that if they're included at the very beginning, the output at the end is also owned uh, as uh, useful. But then also we have to support the realization of existing uh, regional agendas. And this is where as a network, we've uh, really strived to work with the African Union, the UN agencies that we have, for instance, the UN Economic Commission for Africa or the African Development Bank or various regional econom economic uh, uh, commissions. And simply because we cannot work in isolation as a network of science academies, but if we are to influence the region, then we need to be in the spaces where those decisions and those frameworks for development are being made. So trying to find areas and means to be able to partner in the activities, in the discussions, or in the outputs that they produce in those continental frameworks is also something that we've, we've had to do. We've also addressed topical issues, and you can see by the topics that we've tackled. We've also enhanced communication and realized that communication is actually a two-way traffic, so avenues to be able to speak to what the findings of the reports are, but then also to con uh, explore convening opportunities that enables us to be able to talk about the report and engage the stakeholders we want to influence. And that would transcend not just at national level, but we use global and international initiatives. Uh, in how we engage the young people, and I think you've noticed most of the senior academies are actually very uh, male uh, dominated simply because when we started off as science academies, most scientists, most renowned scientists were actually men. And most of them are the ones that came up with the setup that set or started academies. And we've tried to change that. And you've seen even in the activities we do, especially in terms of women for science or things like that, is to try and find avenues to engage, not just the women scientists, but also young scientists. But because we are a network of senior academies, the network has been forced to find avenues to work with young academies as well. And those are uh, many in the continent. Uh, I think we're talking about almost 30 uh, national young academies as, as well. And as a network, we have been mandated and agreed to serve as a liaison office as well for the uh, African national young academies. Uh, we've tried to engage, engage uh, uh, production of integrated uh, solutions and simply because the disciplines of science has to work outside and beyond the uh, silos. And we've also tried to ensure that the scientists not just work with the scientists uh, themselves, but also work with other expertise, the arts, the humanities, uh, the behavioral scientists as well, to be able to make science not just real, realistic, but also uh, practicable. Uh, collaborations we've tried to advocate for is to ensure that uh, within the continent we also see a lot of collaboration because for a very long time we've seen a surge in the uh, uh, north uh, uh, south collaborations as well. And this has to do with not just infrastructure, not just facilities, but also the resources. So we've tried to encourage most of the young people that we engage to seek institutional uh, financial support or local support from national governments or frameworks that are able to provide uh, uh, support to young scientists as well. But then also their continuous engagement in the activities that senior academies do and that uh, the network of academies do. In closing, I want to say that Science advice in the continent, whether we're looking at global social challenges or we're looking at sustainable development goals, it has to make sense uh, and, and have value. Because if science is not useful, then it's just a book or advice that is gathering dust on a shelf somewhere. So we have to anchor whatever advice we give, be it in the booklets or in the reports, that it is anchored on sound uh, uh, science but then also to apply science diplomacy, because that is when science can actually speak to the heart and to the core of the problem that is trying to offer advice to, and to 
also be not just humane, but also apply the spirit with which the solutions are being sought because it is a global uh, challenge. Uh, secondly, we've tried to identify where policy gaps are, because if we were to offer timely science advice, then it needs to speak to something that is lacking or something that we can add value for. But then that influence has really been a challenge in the continent because most uh, uh, solutions are required yesterday, yet it takes some time for uh, science to be able to deliver the results we want. So not only to think of the short term, but also give solutions that would provide, uh, uh, that would bridge the policy gaps in the long haul. To be able to profile and position senior and young academies to be the advisors of their nations, because at national level, we need empowered academies to be able to speak to their own governments. But then at regional level, then the network would be able to engage the network uh, organizations and then engage with IAP at the global level. But uh, uh, last and not least is the science that we speak about to be useful and to be valuable, then it has to be demystified and unpacked in a way that it is actually user friendly and addressing the needs of the target audience. So in everything we do, even as we think of local solution, uh, this pandemic has taught us that, that when you're looking inwardly to be able to survive uh, such uh, uh, a situation, the advice that we give, it's not just applicable uh, in the local context, but it also speak to the global, uh, uh, it speaks to the global voice as well. And you've seen how our reports are able to be translated from the regional reports that they are and influence and contribute to the global reports that we give. So I will stop there and just say thank you very much for your time. And this is the moment when I hear the applause. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Peter. You hear mine anyway. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Jackie. Um, let's pass on very quickly to Teresa. Yes, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. I want to actually build and expand on some of the points Jackie just made about engaging young scientists by talking about the young academies. So Peter mentioned that the Global Young Academy recently became a member of the Inter-Academy Partnership. So I'll talk about the Global Young Academy as well as National Young Academies um, as a platform for engaging early career scientists and actually having them have an outlet to practice and develop leadership skills in addressing some of the social challenges we face. So the Global Young Academy is a worldwide network of 200 members and an alumni network as well from over 80 countries. And I want to acknowledge, I see my um, GYA colleague in the audience, Marion, who's actually pictured here as an immediate past member of the executive committee. So thanks, Marion, for joining. Um, one of the amazing things about the Global Young Academy is the near 50-50 gender balance, which um, as Jackie mentioned is, is rare amongst academies, but not so much amongst the young academies um, that are forming. It's also highly multidisciplinary um, with members in the life and physical sciences, health sciences, but also behavioral sciences and the arts and humanities as well. And um, Amongst young academies, there's a growing movement that members be competitively selected, not only for their scholarship and their research excellence, but for their demonstrated commitment to ensure that science and the work that they're doing is really serving society. So there's, so through the application, you need to demonstrate your outreach and how you have made this, um, this commitment through your own work. The median age is around 39 years old. So this is in the early to mid career stage post PhD. And there is a five year membership term. Um, the vision for the Global Young Academy is to give a voice to young scientists around the world. Many of the goals are aligned with um, the same that would be true of senior academies, 
but the Young Academies provide a mechanism for early career researchers to, to input their voice into policy processes and to ensure more inclusiveness in global decision making. Um, the GYA also informally supports the National Young Academy Network. So there's a growing movement of national young academies, so early career researcher academies around the world. This map shows the countries that currently have a national young academy or a similar body. So there's over 40 countries currently with more in development. And again, the national young academies are supporting this principle that their membership is selected not only for scholarship and research excellence, which is important, but also for their commitment to serving society. Some of the examples of recent work by the Global Young Academy and with some involvement of National Young Academies as well include a COVID-19 statement with recommendations for governments, the public, and young researchers that has been translated into 26 languages by their members. The Global Young Academy has also contributed to three statements from the G7 uh, Senior Science Academies. They've contributed a policy brief on in interlinkages in achieving the SDGs and responding to COVID-19 to the G20, invited to join the steering committee of the World Science Forum, and really importantly, I think have helped set guiding principles for young academies and provide blueprints and support um, for those wishing to support um, the development of a new young academy in their country where those might not exist. And then also offer peer mentorship and support membership in the GYA of at risk and refugee scholars. And the point I really want to make here is that through all of these activities, um, Global Young Academy members are leading these activities every step of the way. So they're developing them, they're fundraising for them, they're managing them, and they're leading them, and they're disseminating them. And by doing that, I think that young researchers are really given a platform to build their own leadership skills that serve them throughout their professional lives. Uh, one other example of an academy's led initiative in this space, again building on the points Jackie made, is um, had the goal of providing emerging African leaders in science direct engagement with science advice for policy experience within Africa. So this initiative of IEP in partnership with the Global Year Academy took um, emerging leading scientists in Africa, early career scientists, and um, offered them a workshop where they would gain policy skills, and then importantly, offered 13 fellowships for short-term immersive experiences in policy active institutions in Africa. So actually NASAC was one of the institutions where scientists could be placed to learn about how policy is made and the role of science in that process and how their own technical training could um, support that. So here are just some photos from the workshop that took place at the Future Africa campus in Pretoria. Um, and then just some conclusions uh, to wrap up here. So I think, again, we have to nurture young leaders around the world in all countries, in science, medicine, engineering, other fields, who are not only excellent researchers, but are also policy savvy, and who importantly are skilled communicators. I think this cannot be overemphasized. I also think in through our experience in doing these um, short-term fellowship programs, like I mentioned, that there's really an unmet demand from early career researchers for training in science advice for policy skills. Um, and workshops can be one mechanism. I really think that fellowships are key in providing these more immersive hands-on experiences for, for young scientists to learn these skills. And then finally, involvement in a young academy is one platform for 
um, early career researchers to gain this experience and to cooperate with others um, and to experience a very multidisciplinary environment. But there are others. And I want to hand over um, next to Atia, who will talk about um, another mechanism. So thanks very much. OK, thank you, Teresa. You get your applause, too. Um, just before Atia gets started, I appreciate we are running out of time. We need to finish at half past the hour. So I'm going to suggest that if anybody out there has any particular questions, um, especially regarding the topic of the conference, based on what you've heard, global leadership for the 21st century, please put them into the chat, and then we'll try and pick one or two um, to mix in maybe with some of the pre-prepared questions that we had um, for, our, for our presenters. Um, but while you're thinking about that, please also give your attention to Atia from South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, evening or morning uh, to everyone. As Peter says, my name is Atia. I'm a public health medicine specialist and a 2019 IAP young physician leader from South Africa. I've been asked today to reflect on my YPL experiences and the opportunities and the challenges for young leaders today. Before I do, I just hope you'll indulge me quickly in a, in a scenario. I just want you to cast your mind to a challenge that you are facing or your country is facing today, whether it be COVID-19 or um, as Cheryl spoke about, you know, food and food security, climate change, racism, gender-based violence, and, you know, any challenge that may be, you know, um, close to your heart. And think about someone that you would invite to collaborate with you on said challenge. Um, I hope you've got that person in your mind. Great. I'm going to get back to this later and ties in directly to what I have learned from YPL. So in thinking about leadership um, and my YPL experience, sorry, it's not going. Um, I've come to realize that, you know, leadership is a journey uh, through and not to something. And, you know, it evolves and changes with a person. And even though my diagram here is quite linear, it really is, has ups and downs. And um, my view of leadership has, has evolved and changed. And while my esteemed colleagues have shared themselves as a case, uh, their case studies, I'm gonna humbly submit myself um, as a case study on how my thinking has changed post YPL. So as with most doctors, you know, I learned about ethics in medical uh, school on the premise that doctors are, you know, leaders in their communities and should um, conduct themselves accordingly. I then underwent, underwent leadership training via a organization called Common Purpose where the concept of leading beyond authority was espoused to really un underpin this concept that we all have within us the ability to lead despite having a title or not having a title. Then um, I went on to train uh, young high school learners from underprivileged backgrounds where you know, I was exposed to the difficulty in instilling leadership in someone where your background doesn't really allow you to think of achieving those um, those aspirations and really led empathy and the ability to embrace empathy in those situations. I underwent formal education through uh, my public health training in leadership and management and then through it all there was sort of service learning on leadership where um, I, you know, I had to utilize skills in terms of in times of crisis such as in the xenophobic attacks uh, most recently um, around the uh, COVID-19 food security. And so I'm sure you're asking yourself, for someone who has had exposure to varied leadership opportunities and experiences, you know, what more could YPL have, off have offered me? Um, before I get to that, I'm just going to tell you quickly, and I know Falker has as well, gone through um, what YPL is, and it is a, you know, annual leadership event where 40 leaders um, who are already in leadership positions are nominated by their academies. And we attend a, a five-day event in Berlin, including a leadership workshop and a joint presentation. Currently, 
Um, we have 214 alumni in 57 countries after 10 years of YPL. And we have continued to collaborate post the um, YPL summit that we had in, in Berlin last year. So given that we all have, are in leadership positions or have had some sort of journey similar to mine, you know, you probably are wondering what does YPL, what makes YPL different? Um, what, what it did for me was it exposed me to one big opportunity and two real big lessons. The opportunity that I took away with from this was that I came to find a family of peers that I could connect and engage with regarding challenges that we uniquely face. Um, this was directly related to the realization that peer support is absolutely essential to our journeys as physicians and as leaders. You know, I've always wondered how senior leaders seem to have this network of support and how they actually, you know, hone these networks. And this mystery was somewhat resolved for me when we did a peer support activity where we presented a leadership challenge to our peers, a group of our peers, and they gave us feedback from their viewpoints. And the sense of camaraderie and encouragement during the session was actually palpable. Um, to the extent that many of the group remarked afterwards how much they enjoyed the session, I think that gives us a bit of insight into just how lonely sometimes the journey some of our career paths can take, that most of us felt uh, the sense of camaraderie from this, from this interaction. The second learning took place for me during an exchange when we were planning for the World Health Summit panel that we were presenting. I, as a South African, I am very uh, aware that my default lens through which I view any activity is that of equity and of representation. And so it was with this in mind that I remarked to colleagues that we should ensure that our panel is, is balanced in terms of gender. A female colleague um, remarked to me, and she felt very strongly so, that to do so would basically um, espouse the view that women are not always um, uh, have worked, have not always worked hard or achieved that spot on on these panels. And this was somewhat surprising to me, although it shouldn't be surprising to me because we should be aware of other worldviews. And you know, we all know that the dangers of confirmation bias of groupthink. And most recently, we have even algorithms that tailor our news feeds to our worldview. And it is increasingly becoming the mark of a good leader when opposing and unpalatable views are not only acknowledged but engaged with. So this opportunity for this congenial discourse at YPL with differing views was really, really refreshing. And my only regret is that I did not engage more with this colleague on why our views on, on how women would be perceived if there was gender equality, um, you know, that I did not unpack that with her. So I'm not the only person though that um, saw the value in engaging with others. A colleague of mine, Isaac Morrow, who is a Tanzanian gentleman who now lives in Japan, says, and I quote, um, in most of the places we meet people with the same background and it's very hard to know what is right and what is wrong. Uh, here I have met people from different countries and different cultures and I really have been learning a lot on how to really deal with human beings. I thought it was a wonderful quote is from the YPL video that they took of us last year. So fast forward to today and you know how do these lessons uh, play out for young leaders? I think they are they are not only relevant today for us, but for the whole of society. Um, COVID-19 has unceremoniously brought to bear the complex enmeshment of health and what we know is the social determinants of health. Uh, all countries have seen the impact um, on all of their sectors, on their entire population, and we've had to institute sort of a whole of government approach to truly embrace uh, health in all policies. Concurrent to this, we have seen you know, instances where the impact of the virus is not just the virus itself, but impacts on security and racism and gender-based violence. So amongst this myriad of challenges, there are opportunities for young leaders to replicate these learnings from YPL. In the midst of COVID, we have, many of us have been called upon to lead beyond our authority. 
We've been solving complex problems, novel problems in our workplaces that we've never been faced with before. We've been advocating for public health measures to communities, especially in the face of you know, um, false news and the denialism that exists. So many of us have then leaned on each other, um, on our peers for support and advice in how to deal with these. And so in my mind, formal training and experiential learning on leadership is undeniably important, but the value of solving difficult problems, whether they be leadership or otherwise, with people who are like-minded in their goals, but varied in their perspectives need to be recognized. Peer support and engagement should be fostered. And in a world where we have connectivity that has never been easier, I mean, we are all sitting in different countries at the moment, um, it is important that we have platforms to encourage these engagements. To this end, uh, the 2019 YPLs are embarking on a global ward round on COVID-19, where we are hoping that this will provide an opportunity for YPLs across the world to share their individual and their country experiences and learnings on COVID-19. We have presentations from Nepal, Mongolia, Ghana, South Africa, Morocco, Italy, Thailand, and it's open to everyone. Teresa is going, will post the, the sign up link on our chat. And we really feel that while YPLs allow us to create our own opportunities and engage with like minded and similarly accomplished leaders, to an extent, we are, we are able to engage with global leadership at the World Health Summit, but there's still a vacuum, uh, somewhat of mentorship and created opportunity for young leaders. I'm going to talk very specifically about the country level response to COVID-19. We most countries have established task teams, you know, of esteemed scientists and experts in order to address the pandemic. And the common refrain we hear from politicians is, you know, we apologize if we have made errors, we are facing unprecedented challenges. What we do not hear or see a lot is an attempt to mentor or include young leaders in these responses in a way that ensures that future leaders are slightly more prepared for the challenges that I think we will be probably continually facing as a global. So on an individual level, um, despite peer engagements, the importance of an experienced mentor and an advocate cannot be discounted. Mentorship offers guidance and support and sometimes opportunities, but there are very few avenues for young leaders to seek out such mentors. Through mentorship, we can we not only inspire confidence in our young leaders, many of whom suffer from imposter syndrome, but we also provide them with the opportunity to share their views and ideas. And in doing so, you know, a mentorship relationship need not be a one-way benefit. It also provides experienced mentors with a viewpoint and the experience of a younger generation of leaders. So in conclusion, I really want to implore acad academies and institutions to not only provide platforms for peer support, um, but mentorship as well, especially given that many of these esteemed scientists that I'm talking about who are solving the world's problems today are affiliated with these academies. And in doing so, we foster an environment where we actively seek out viewpoints different to ours, leading to better problem solving and more innovative ideas. But finally, this doesn't mean that the work lies only with the academies. I think the path to better leadership and a better world lies within all of us. So this brings me back to the scenario I posed to you at the beginning. If you cast your mind back to the person that you selected, I'd like you to ask yourself, how different is this person to you in age, in gender, ethnicity, nationality, field, or even possibly, most importantly, how different are they to you in their worldview? And then I would challenge you to challenge yourself to seek out those that may offer a different perspective that is some, sometimes vastly different from your own. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Atia. Um, and I think you've also done a very good job of summing up um, a lot of the the issues that had sort of developed through the previous speakers and addressing them, targeting them as to the the theme of of this whole conference on global leadership in the 21st century. So thank you for that. Um, 
before before you spoke, um, I offered the chance to um, people that are listening out there to ask their questions in, in the chat. And we, we've received one, um, which is about how IAP is represented in the ASEAN region. So this is the um, Southeast Asia region. Um, we do have academies in that area. Um, in the Philippines, in Malaysia, um, in Indonesia, several of the other countries there, we are working very closely with them. There are some countries in the ASEAN region that don't yet have academies. Um, so our network in Asia, for the you saw it is ASSA, A-A-S-S-A, -S -S -A, the ASSA network, we hope is reaching out to those countries. Um, Cambodia is one, for example, and Vietnam, another that don't have um, official science academies as yet. So as Jackie and her colleagues have been doing in Africa, trying to grow the numbers of African science academies, our colleagues in the ASEAN region are doing that. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we've just got about four minutes left. So I wanted to go back to um, our panel and ask maybe a couple of questions um, from the, the pre-prepared questions that we have. Um, and perhaps one for, um, one for Cheryl, the, the food and nutrition program, the activity that you um, spoke about. What do you think the biggest success of, of that has been? You can need to unmute. There we go. <laughs> I think that the the broad involvement of so many people, and there were people, young younger people, more mature people, it was a range of different perspectives. But I think the opportunity to engage um, on such a complex topic and focus on it was the most important um, component and then being able to feed that into for example the s20 um, preparatory meetings where the insight was was appreciated yeah i would say that's the most the most successful component and combining the the communication um, component with the with science policy and the the hard science evidence okay thank you of course, many of these issues like food and nutrition, climate change and health, um, poverty and equity, um, science alone cannot provide the answer. You really need that, that team of experts to come up with the, um, the sort of central knowledge, if you like, to, to take the, the advice forward. Um, if I can just bring in Volker in the last couple of minutes, um, you know, these are very complex issues. I mean, some in the literature, they're sometimes described as wicked issues. Um, what do you think are the, the successes of science advice in these policy making um, arenas? And perhaps what are the limitations? I know, I know we could talk an hour and a half on that as well, but maybe just to sort of sum up on the successes and limitations. So you're on mute. So if you the experience I have you now from my participation in the European Academy of Science Advisory Council, and this can also reflect, of course, to IAP, that it is important if you want to give science advice to policymakers that you, number one, pick a topic which is of great interest to society and, politi and politics at, at this particular time, what is coming up in the next month or half a year. And when you take this up, you can be, be guaranteed that uh, people are listening to you because they have to have problems to solve. And for this, this is, uh, they welcome some advice. Of course, we know that whatever advice we give is science-based and uh, uh, this advice will then be taken. It will be either rejected for, for many reasons or it will be taken or it certainly will then finally be in a democratic way be actually uh, implemented in one way or the other. The other thing which I noticed in, in Europe is that, that uh, the, the document which has been signed by the member academies 
of ESAC, which represent each member state actually in the EU, is very important that this uh, so-called member academies endorses this document. And once this is endorsed, the document is, has a higher acceptance in, in the pol political arena because the representative of each country in the EU realizes that its own academy has, has signed it and has approved it. This is something which is a push one, one really should do. And of course, the third you know, observation I, I can make is that the activity in ESAC has made it obvious to the uh, European Commission and European Parliament that whatever they decide is not only of importance for Europe, but has also a global impact, in particular to Africa. So whatever you do on the, the ag agriculture arena, and you make decisions, one has to keep in mind that this has automatically mostly negative um, impact on Africa. For example, the GMO or the, the situation that we in Europe cannot use uh, gene modified crops. That is still a big discussion that European uh, um, members rejected, not thinking that the world needs this type of technology or so really create enough food and to get rid of pesticides and so forth. So I would say one, one, has, one needs a long, long breath, as one would say in German, to achieve something one should never give up. And I think for IAP, I think what we have done so far is a wake up call that the regions can, can profit from each other if they do something with the regional networks. And there is a much more concise idea to do something together as it has been in the past. So I would say we are very optimistic that we achieve something. Also, you know, it, it has still to go on and things have to improve continuously. But I think IAP is worth it that it is. And if it would not exist yet, it has to be created. OK, thank you, Volker. Um, we've just got one final question come through in the, in the, the chat. What advice would you give for someone who has no experience in leadership but wants to become a leader in the sustainability field? I'm going to pass that one to Teresa to, to answer. Okay, thank you. Just very quickly. Um, first, Atia mentioned there's sort of non-traditional ways that you might think of that you can still be a leader. So even if you're, you're not heading up an organization or something, you can still um, practice those skills. Um, for early career researchers, there are opportunities through the Young Academies, as I mentioned, fellowships, but also I would recommend um, the UN Major Group for Children and Youth, and also being active in the other UN um, major groups. The International Science Council leads the UN Major Group for Science and Technology, you would, you would look into that. And through ISC and IEP, there are often calls for experts in various um, ways, for example, feeding into UN processes, uh, UNESCO documents, particularly in sustainability, that you might be interested in volunteering to take part in. So I'd recommend those. Okay, um, and I think with that, I'm not sure how the moderators um, work this, but I think I'm just going to say thank you to all our speakers. Maybe we can turn all our microphones on and give, give each other a round of applause. <laughs> um, for, um, for all of you out there listening, thank you for, for that. We hope we've managed to um, raise some points for you to, to consider, um, answer the, some questions. We tried to take as many questions from the chat that we could, could deal with. We hope we've dealt with those appropriately enough. Um, thank you all for t participating. Okay, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning to you. All right, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.